good evening from india and uh, good morning and good afternoon in various parts of the world thank you for uh, logging in uh, my name is uh, rajendra shinde uh, i am a product of iit bombay having worked in india's private sector as well as united nations for nearly two decades presently i am chairman of tair policy center i must apologize that uh, my video camera has suddenly decided not to cooperate so that's why you are hearing my voice only and somebody told me that when i am not visible on a video and uh, only audio is on in fact my performance improves so let me believe in that and go ahead in welcoming today's speakers for an excellent debate topic that uh, we have and both the speakers are going to be very very interesting and those who deeply dive into the subject anything to do with the united nations united nations security council and united nations general assembly uh probably i don't have that much experience of uh, united nations general assembly and security council but i know the united nations system exceedingly well having got into very close contact with those who matter those who give the funding those who implement those who succeed and those who fail so our first speaker is ambassador manjeev singh puri he was a former indian ambassador to european union belgium luxembourg nepal and he has served in indian missions abroad in germany cape town that is south africa muscat thailand and venezuela he also served which is more important for today's event as an ambassador and deputy permanent representative of india to the united nations for 3 years and that 3 years 2009 to 2012 was a period during which india was on a security council as a non permanent member as you know security council has 15 members five permanent then the five are selected by elected by uh, general assembly and remaining are all uh, representing their regions in a very equitable fashion uh, he held the vice presidency of un general assembly when he was in new york his major areas of experience have the roots in his strong belief in multilateralism and he was very close to the debate of un reforms his professional focus has been on issues relating to the environment as well like climate climate change and sustainable development and has taken part in a climate negotiation ambassador puri has a masters degree in management and he is a graduate of St Stephen's College Delhi he is presently a distinguished fellow at the Energy and Resource Institute TERI T E R I welcome ambassador and uh, our second speaker am i audible atharva yes sir okay thanks Uh, our second speaker is Professor Jyot Thomas. Professor Jyot Thomas has worked in a senior management and in the leadership positions with number of international organizations in Australia, South Africa, Nepal, Hong Kong, East Timor, Bangladesh, Switzerland, and USA, and of course in India. he was a technical advisor to world health organization who and asia's regional advisor for the leading 
child health centered charities he has been part of the initiative focusing on advice to the ministers diplomats and senior officials having conducted research in icmr indian council of medical research universities in hong kong he has authored four books and more than 50 peer reviewed articles he was also executive director of 26 member intergovernmental organization and he was associated as a academics par excellence as a pro vice chancellor dean etc and as well as more important researcher in the areas of sustainability global health diplomacy and policy dialogue presently he is a professor of public health at institute of health management in victoria and australia so here we start i am i am not certain whether anyone in the audience would need an introduction to the united nations and probably the system it employs to maintain peace and security in the world which is its prime function as per united nation charter which was formulated between 1942 and 45 many consider that united nation though peace and security is on the top of the agenda it has become an institution of power politics i'm using slightly moderated terms to say that because probably the things are more intense as far as the power politics concern in united nations but for the today's debate i think the what is coming out in the context and in the backdrop is india has become a non permanent member of united nations security council for the eighth time in january 2021 and india will remain so for two years till the end of 2022 which is going to be a very challenging time from all the spheres that we are witnessing today that is covid 19 climate change and never ending conflicts between the countries and within the countries and i am not going to dwell upon those in detail because that will come up in the debate itself the question is india has a great standing in international platform mainly because of our leadership i'm not talking about only international day for yoga but very recent act of india which talked about or which was demonstrated by giving covid vaccine produced in india to nearly 90 countries at the cost of even its own society and that became a big debate within india but there was no doubt that internationally it was acclaimed action even the most powerful country and prominent member of united nation usa has been repeatedly saying that india was a real friend of the world because friend in need is a friend indeed having got that kind of a image are we going to make any change any difference by being a president of the united nations security council and my proposition to the two public speakers are that we don't see any move to be out of box to be someone who is going to make a difference because even a, our minister of external affairs has said that though it is a singular honor for india to be the president of the security council in the same month when we are celebrating our 75th independence day we will be a country which will believe in moderation peace and dialogue that is hardly any new proposition so my first question to the both the speakers 
starting with ambassador and then going to the professor. Is India determined to make any change as a president of Security Council or it is going to be a routine affair? Even if India has a chance to do something. Ambassador, floor is yours. You have to unmute yourself and then start speaking. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Shende, thank you very much for this invitation and thank you to your policy center too. If you don't mind, I want to say a big thank you to Professor Joto because it was he who introduced me to you. And I want to thank him because only the other day he chaired so very well a policy dialogue that we had on roughly the same subject. Now, you know, I'm a practitioner. And I like Professor Joe Thomas because he's a dreamer. You know, frankly, we must dream. It's only when you dream that you work towards something. Practitioners, by definition, you know, tend to look at nitty gritties, get into the act, and of course, deliver. But uh, there has to be there have to be visions. Now, let me say a few things for your viewers so that matters are a little clear and a little better understood, even as we dream. In my understanding, India is a country with a manifest destiny insofar as its place on the global high table is concerned. And this, let me tell you, has nothing to do with uh, X leadership or Y leadership. It is the nature of the construct. Usually, we used to say that we are the second largest country in the world, the largest democracy. But you know, in five years' time, we'll be the largest country in the world. And I hope you understand that even the symbolism of that becomes radically different from being the second largest country in the world. And think about it the way the world works. We will also be among the three largest economies in the world, although I believe still for a very long time a developing country, nowhere near the per capita incomes that would develop countries in the world. Having said this, let me make another one or two points quite clear for your viewership. The United Nations is not international government. I know, Mr. Shende, you worked in the Montreal Protocol. I'm not sure if this is the place where I can highlight how it came about and what happened. Uh, you said you know the system very well. I am sure you know it. And therefore, you started by saying you know the donors. Very important. You said you also know who are the people who get things done. That, sir, is what is called global governance vastly different from global government, so it has nothing to do with global government. Right. And the United Nations is intrinsically and essentially a power play game. I don't think we should have any doubts on this. It is a continuum of the Westphalian theories, which came about for more than 100 years. Indeed, multilateralism, as we know it today, is marking 100 years this year with the birth of the League of Nations. There were some intrinsic flaws in it. Uh, things didn't go right. We had the United Nations. Remember, there has been no third world war since the United Nations came about. So in a sense, it has fulfilled its principal role. No matter what we are saying that, you know, it's not delivering, not doing anything. Let me say another thing. To you. While it was initially set up, or let me say the fundamental idea was international governance and basically keeping a lid on various things, but doing a kind of balance between the two real powers, which emerged after the World War II, Russia and the Soviet Union and the United States, Britain on the other side. Something very interesting happened. Even in those days, the issue of human good got added on. So if you remember, while the WHO goes back a long time and so does ILO, the FAO got founded. We also had the World Bank, IMF, which were, of course, initially set up to ensure reconstruction of Europe. The World Bank used to be called the International Bank of Reconstruction and Development. But again, as a result of good work done by people from India, more than any other country in the world, we brought in the dimension of development. And so the United Nations system, and I include in this the World Bank, the IMF, the WTO, and all other such bodies, including your Montreal Protocol, etc. It has also become a tool for doing something for human good. Mm -hmm. There are a not, lot of things. CGIAR system has been the greatest help to us in the Green Revolution. 
we are now struggling if we if i may agree with what is going on with surpluses from a ship to mouth existence let us also understand polio eradication let us understand so many different way areas where things have happened i know the who is going through a bit of a bad phase being called all kinds of names but you know it has been the organization which has seen to it that polio is virtually eradicated in the world it's been the place where so many standards etc have got developed and so on and so forth let's look at climate change if we are look, look and i know that today covid is the big huge thing in bold letters but you know at the end of the day it hopefully will get controlled in the next year or two once we do some better vaccination we all perhaps were not up to the mark the developed countries more than the developing countries easier to heap the blame on who but the ones who run the who in terms of your own definition to run the thing really didn't pony up and didn't do a great job so when we look at the greatest challenge in the world climate change if there is going to be a way forward other than technological advancement and completely new discoveries getting rid of carbon it is going to come through the via media of the united nations because it lends a certain legitimacy people buy on to it and even when they sometimes disagree they say we've taken the agreement we need to honor it. now coming to the security council so this is the eighth time india is serving on the security council remember we were a charter member we were also a founding member of the league of nations incidentally even though we were a dependency at that time a colonial country even in 1945 we were a colony so in 70 years we've served eight times on the security council great the presidency comes by rotation we've got our task it happens coincidentally to be in august a year in which we are celebrating beginning of 75 years of our independence let me tell you the last time we served on the security council which was exactly 10 years back and i was part of the indian team there in august we then also had the presidency now whether it's a coincidence or not at that time the arab spring had just got unfolded did anybody think that there would be a thing like the arab spring even at the end of 2010 the answer is absolutely no and yet in january 2011 we were only grappling with arab spring and in august the first time the security council adopted a presidential statement on syria let me tell you till then they couldn't get anything through it was the indian president this time there has been something on afghanistan i don't know i don't know these are torturous and difficult processes countries play games various things happen on this you asked me one question about reform sir i am a firm and convinced believer that india as i said once earlier has a manifest destiny it will happen in one month's time no sir i think we should be crystal clear and i don't think anyone is talking about it but we have to remain at it remember we are the demand doers and how does change come about it comes about when the demand doers keep asking but the others who are the recipient sides of it they realize that bringing the demand doers in is better for them than leaving them out and i'll just give you one example and then stop here in 2008 the g20 which used to be a meeting of finance ministers dealing with imf and started off at the time of the asean crisis why did they suddenly enlarge it to heads of state and government a simple answer was a straight forward one china is too big to not to shoulder global responsibility but they also took in india they took in brazil they took in nigeria and so on of course one of the reasons was let's have more to share the burden but on the other hand they recognize these are players who can share the burden which means that on the power game there is a recognition that you are if not arrive you are an arriving nation and hence i believe we must i i will use this term again we should always in articulations diplomatically etc state our frustration that things are not going forward but never get frustrated remain at it you were not grandfathered it will take a long time before you as you push the cart and i have no idea how the road will unfold but remain at it and destiny is yours thank you um atharva am i audible yes sir yes sir <clears throat> okay thank you ambassador i think uh, the key message is uh is not a momentary attempts to catch the 
situation but keep on working on it in a in a manner that will make a difference that that's the point you you made it uh professor uh, i just want to recall a question which i'm asking that knowing the international standing of india and you know some of the examples which have been thrown uh by ambassador as well as by me should we have some kind of an adventurous agenda of course you can't have a isolated agenda and i am sure india must be consulting other countries also to decide the agenda as a president of security council for one month and probably it is going to remain a non permanent member for two years now so it's not just a question of one month shouldn't india try some of the out of box smart and un appropriate adventures to make the difference um thank you dr rajesh shinde uh, terre policy center and um, also ambassador puri in fact i enjoyed much of my discussion with uh, ambassador puri as well as with uh, dr rajesh shinde the behind the scene discussion about uh, hosting this uh, this debate and um, uh, and also today is august 14th the eve of the independence day maybe let me take the privilege of um, greeting and an and advance independence day and it's the 75th year we are beginning so it is very significant so and this is very appropriate time to discuss about um, india's role in the international relationship dr shinde rightly suggested that we should look at certain out of the box thinking at the un security council not only at the un security council india's international relationship or india's diplomacy i carefully reviewed the program of action presented by the our honorable ambassador um at uh, at the security council as our program of action for for the month of august and they talked about uh, the traditional issues uh, middle east uh, crisis afghanistan israel sorry israel and palestinian conflict and all the issues they talked about it but uh, uh, amplifying what uh, dr shinde said probably this is an opportunity for us to think outside the box and i would say that one of the great opportunity for india to think outside the box is looking at the health and increasingly health is becoming an important element in the global relationship and it's a right time it's an opportunity for reflection in the context of the role of india and the un security council chairmanship and also the continuing membership of the un security council and also we know that uh, indian security and uh, indian um, uh, uh, the, the the idea of indian foreign policy indian diplomacy is based on the concept of uh, the the development partnership and quite often we present our diplomatic efforts in the in the framework of um, as a development partnership we are not much on progressing on or pushing on the idea of um, security from the context of militarization india never went for a, a military aggression in the real sense to other countries so that way we have certain traditional ethos values we cherish at the international relationship interestingly we Uh, created a, a portfolio of extensive portfolio of international action in the area of global health and it is if you look at carefully try to unpack it it's very fascinating and i would say that this is an opportunity to build upon what happening what happened in the area of global health how india acted decisively on various aspect of it and um, i'll just go through some of the india's global effort in looking at health related issues and india's effort to address some of the global health issues and to begin with un security council resolution uh, 20 uh, 2565 of 2021 on february 26th come uh, security council resolution came that clearly mentioned the need for a global response to the covid pandemic under the un leadership and probably this gives an opportunity to india to look at the take stock of what happened how the un response to the the, the security council uh, resolution is taking place and we know that we are talking about almost 4 million people dying and almost 400 million people are 
infected or affected by COVID pandemic. So this is a significant issue. It is touching the core of global peace, global security, and human security and health security. So and and definitely this is a reason. And there is an opportunity. There is all the legitimate reason why India should take up uh, the the role of uh, global health in the in the context of uh, Security Council leadership. And also, when when we look at um, uh, the other effort India is doing in the area of uh, global health, India contributed towards the UNDP UN Development Fund, and it was basically for the small country and uh, and also uh, small developing countries and islands nation pro program support fund. But increasingly, that fund is used for the vac vaccine equity. And India supported, supplied vaccine to all the peacekeeping mission. And also, India, Indian military hospital to peacekeeping mission is substantially contributed towards the health and well being of the peacekeeping mission. And India supplied vaccine to 95 countries. And India has got a memorandum of understanding with more than 80 countries to looking at specifically on issues of health. And those who are familiar with uh, the medicines, global trade on medicines, vaccines, India is known as the pharmacy of the world. India support majority of the generic medicine to the world, particularly the developing countries and also the African continent. And also we know that India is the largest producer of the vaccine in the world, not only the COVID, I mean, we are talking about, about almost 20 vaccines, including the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the various other uh, non-communicable disease vaccination. And India created a SAR COVID emergency fund, just to give another example about um, India's global contribution. And India is playing an active role in the global TB prevention program. And prevention of maternal and child health deaths and uh, PMNCH program, India is uh, actively played the role. India cha uh, chaired the, uh, the global movement for the global partnership for the maternal and child health issues. And also India looked at the impact of trade, global trade on health. And India requested the World Trade Organization to look at the issue of uh, intellectual property rights, how it can be uh, removed in the context of um, COVID-related vaccines and diagnostic facilities. So, and also we are talking about the post sdg role in the health. Probably we had to start thinking about how health is playing to play an active role in the 2030 global agenda. And again, health is an important aspect of global disaster response. Again, India played a significant role in various other countries. And again, when we look at carefully the emerging health impact of global environmental crisis, we know that there is a need for a global leadership and a global action. There are many globalized responses coming up and probably this is also an opportunity and a responsibility for India to take leadership. And again, we mentioned about the India's growing aspiration to become a member of the UN Security Council uh, a, a membership. And probably this is a time to demonstrate a UN Security Council member-like behavior, taking global leadership on critical issues and emerging issues. And there's no doubt that COVID pandemic brought home the urgency to address health security and global health today is the global peace. To ensure the strategic advantage, it is time for a policy framework on health diplomacy. And probably the best opportunity to present this health diplomacy framework and to operationalize it is at the UN Security Council, and particularly in the context of India's chairmanship. And at least they can flag India's uh, readiness to take in the global uh, public health leadership in various aspects of them, particularly in developing countries, and, and also building upon what we have done. In nutshell, what I want to say is that India's leadership at the UN Security Council is largely symbolic, but that symbolism gives us an opportunity to set certain agenda, to set certain agenda on the table. And that agenda is definitely we are look at peace. But we have certain opportunities are coming up. For example, it's almost as an academician, as a, um, a practitioner, I have the freedom to say that um, Probably we had look at um, look east when we look at Afghanistan. The situation is very critical, and probably there is a um, there's a possibility of um, the elected government may be replaced by a non-elected regime. Maybe this is an opportunity to think about a global peacekeeping mission to send to Afghanistan, and India could play a very active role in. And that that, that may be one of the critical role to play in ensuring that uh, people's aspirations are ensured, women and children's are, um, rights are protected, and also an elected government will not be overtaken by 
a, 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 a regime which is almost uh, designated as um, a terrorist organization. So this is a critical. And also, I would say that um, India got a very friendly relationship with the Myanmar. The military transition, the military leadership in, in Myanmar is a critical issue for um, Southeast Asia. India could have played a very active role in, in taking the issue or initiating a dialogue between um, the democratic process in Afghan, in sorry, in, in Myanmar. So that right, Joe. Joe, uh, I think we'll come to this uh, Myanmar and uh, Afghanistan issue in a moment. Okay. But you made a you made a solid point about the health diplomacy, and indeed the world is trapped in an unprecedented situation due to COVID pandemic, and we do not have an integrated, collective, and comprehensive strategy to fight that enemy. So you are insisting on a. Peacekeeping thing is is okay, but we need to go beyond that to understand what it takes to make a peace. So my question to uh, the ambassador, who has seen the many UN forums, and as you say that it is a it's a powerful game. Uh, it is the only game in the world, uh, which which is very distinct, but it's a pretty powerful game. Why Security Council? or even a general assembly not able to take any decision related to how to fight in a very aggressive way of this virus and because this virus is upsetting not only the economic front but is upsetting our belief in a united nations that is that system or is that organization really make us comfortable due to some of the other methods that they use in order to do a collective research equitable distribution of vaccine and getting into the a channel for helping the poorest or the weaker section or vulnerable section of the society and if it is so why indian agenda which was explained on first or i think 3rd of august by our ambassador uh, tirumurthy he said that there are three items maritime security counter terrorism and peacekeeping and peacekeeping is always uh, uh, there on our agenda of united nations any day so that remains only two that counter terrorism and maritime but he didn't talk about the health at all and do you, don't you think that the great opportunity is lost ambassador you muted ambassador please unmute yourself yeah, sorry thank Apologies. you uh, dr shende i must say no and he was absolutely right the permanent representative Dr. Jende, I think we all need to understand institutions and what institutions are about. And I, I said this earlier to Dr. Thomas, we mustn't conflate organizations. The UN Security Council is not like a governing body of the UN. It is a body very specifically designed to look at guns, weapons, violence, and that to a traditional type. and there is a very good reason why that is the case because there are five countries which have overriding voting abilities there which can stop anything from happening and which can even demand such kinds of resolutions which make it binding on you to act on them whether you like it or not like sanction therefore please let us not conflate the united nations with the un security council the ideas of professor thomas are excellent ideas and they must be part of the un assembly at the un proper they are part of the general assembly and otherwise the world health assembly which is almost the same thing as the un general assembly is the same countries which are taking part in and i am very strongly of the view that the pandemic has given us an opportunity to work hard to be able to press a global health agenda and to you know use it as an opportunity to put our own 
positions, our own ideas forward. I completely agree with you there, but not in the Security Council. Let's leave the thing aside. It's in, you know, how do I tell you? In in normal times, I mean, uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in most countries, let's say India, the police is very powerful. Would you like to ask them to take care of uh, ICU running and hospitalization, etc.? No, under no circumstances. So they don't know how to do it. And they can enforce things which are not correct. I'm sorry to have used uh, uh, an, an expression for an institution which is a good institution otherwise, but for the job that it's supposed to do. So <laughs> let's be very clear on this. Now, you know, India is serving as the chairman of the executive board of the WHO. I'm not in government. I am a private citizen. I, for one, firmly believe in what you said, that uh, this was an opportunity and this continues to be an opportunity for us to, uh, to press for several areas of reform in the global health infrastructure, including collaborative research, including vaccinations being more easily available, and finally, in things such as looking at aspects that, you know, can you really do something which harms human well-being? You know, I'm, I don't want to refer to bioterrorism, etc., but let's refer to all of those, those kind of things. All of them form squarely under the domain of the World Health Organization. I don't see us very active there. I don't have the answers for that. That has nothing to do with the presidency of the UN Security Council. By the way, uh, on the Security Council, let us remember we did introduce a subject which has not been traditionally there, but which is very much part of the mandate, which is maritime security. And the Honorable Prime Minister himself led that debate. The first time a Prime Minister from India has addressed the Security Council. So we, we do things, but you must remember the boundaries. And the reason why you must remember the boundaries is you'd like to be around the table, sir. You don't want to be on the table. Remember these particular words. You want to be rule makers not rule takers. And at that place, at the moment, the things are a little different. So it's like it's something that needs to be quite clearly understood and internalized. And then what we want the UN, the multilateral system to do, absolutely we are with you. I mean, anybody would be with you. And I do think these are opportunities. It continues to be an opportunity for India. Uh, we, we, we believe we are a force for good. And we act as a force for them. And uh, I think people like both you, Dr. Shende, and Professor Thomas are some of India's great contribution for these forces for good. And uh, I'm leaving peacekeeping out. That's a different kind of force for good also. But if we stick to this particular thing, I think there are lots of opportunities. And I think this opportunity will continue. We need to do something. At the WTO, we are working with South Africa for a IPR patents waiver. Looks difficult. Why do you think it looks difficult? I mm. mean, do you think Mr. Biden minces his words in terms of his sympathy for the world on COVID? Does anybody in the world, any the Europeans, the British, does anybody say, we don't want to help the world? They all say, we want to help the world, but they won't agree on the IPR. Why? I say, do you know the kind of money that their big drug companies have made? We need to reach that point. I don't have the answers to that. You all are experts and technical experts. But we really re need to reach to be in that game. Yes, we are one of the five which have produced a vaccine. But, you know, it's, it's quantities, etc. I'm not talking about SII, which is the subcontract. But, you know, uh, if I really look at the vaccine which India has produced, I mean, its abilities are not that many. It will grow. I'm so happy that we've done it. But... We must keep plugging at it becoming our time. I have no doubt in my mind it shall be our time, perhaps sooner rather than later. Thank you. I think the takeaway from your this uh, second response in the debate is that whatever the priority have been set by India as a president of uh, Security Council for one month, I think they were right. I totally agree with you, they're right. What we are trying to do is, knowing that we are surrounded by this unique issue of pandemic, what kind of rules we set? Because I know that you made a very important comment that rule making is different than implementing the rule or taking the rules to the society and make it happen. Yes, that is the issue. But 
the person like me now i'm i'm leaving my united nation experience slightly behind to say that aren't we in a situation where whatever is going on for last 70 75 years need to be relooked at in order to move ahead and that opportunity has come due to the covid 19 so i'm coming back to the professor i'm coming back to the professor by saying that the way the power politics is being played in a security council or even in general assembly and i will give you some quick example before i invite joe to do that uh, uh, answer that see the security council has only one resolution since the uh, pandemic has started and that is a resolution number 2532 which talks about the equity and making sure that we need to have a global cease fire and it is nowadays called as a vaccine cease fire in the countries where the battles are going on and we know the examples is the iraq syria afghanistan etc etc so united nations secretary general said cease fire till the pandemic is over and probably take a chance that let it not come again those conflicts for doing it now when that kind of a resolution came there was a intervention by the security council members in a very funny way they started talking and linking that to some of the instances earlier and i am not a great fan of us uh, uh, usa's uh, um, um representatives or their stand in united nations security council but you know as a as a citizen of india i felt that her intervention on this particular resolution which took more than 3 months to get passed by that time i don't know how many mil, uh, millions of people lost their life or became invalid but she said you know shame on each of us security council members that i am is astonished that when we are talking about covid pandemic we are bringing in the border politics conflict politics is a shameful and i think most of the citizens in the world might have liked that comment so my question to joe now is one resolution in security council on covid 19 and two resolutions in general assembly and that also is the global solidarity to fight covid 19 international cooperation to ensure that and probably the weak efforts by who to make sure that people act collectively i mean i, I i'm not really criticizing the whole thing but i'm saying that what common citizen must be thinking about this world governance professor jo sorry and thank you dr shinde and let me acknowledge the position taken by ambassador puri we know we have to play the boundaries of the diplomacy and india played a if you look at that point of view it's perfectly fit into our, our traditional understanding about what un security council can do and we could even say that um, the, uh, the maritime security initiative was a, a brilliant stroke from the within the given limitation we pushed one agenda forward which has got a very re uh, immediate re relevance for the india's um, financial and economic and security consideration and uh, absolutely no doubt at all but my argument is that um, there are certain international opportunities are coming up which we should grab it and uh, in the diplomacy we know that when now there's an opportunity to expand push our boundaries and take one step further we grab it and you know it very well we do not let it go any opportunity to expand our position our our um, understanding about the global situation and also to make the presence felt about the issues and this is also in the, in the two context i would say that the the global response towards covid pandemic is not an isolated concern it's a global concern so we have an opportunity we are on the cusp of a leadership and we could have grabbed it we can put it in the agenda that's the one possibility second possibility we are an aspiring member for a permanent seat at the security council maybe we should act and behave like 
a security council member by giving direction, giving our aspiration goals, and also consolidating the global response towards COVID pandemic, because it's a very legitimate uh, leadership opportunity. And the third, I would say that um, probably COVID pandemic is a critique of our understanding about uh, security. COVID pandemic is nothing more other than human security or the health security. Uh, uh, the, the global, the military industry and um, what you call, we have our um, very sophisticated um, surveillance mechanism, very sophisticated intelligence mechanism, none contributed towards pre preventing forecasting and doing something about preventing such a hu huge human security, health security consideration. So this is a time to look at our understanding about what is security. And I would recast our security consideration from border security emphasis to human security consideration. I'm just presenting some of the ideas. I know that um, these are not in the traditional understanding about um, security, but we have to look at a um, new way of looking at diplomacy. And in many countries, particularly developing countries, health is an integral part of their foreign relationship. Health-related products, health-related trade, health, how the health implication of the trade agreement, this all very carefully calibrated and um, monitored by many developing countries. And also to say, many of the developing countries, they have developed countries, they have their own health ambassadors. US got a health ambassador, Japan got a health ambassador, UK, Australia, they have designated ambassadors roving ambassadors looking at the issue of health. So global health diplomacy is a legitimate expansion of our foreign policy practice. So from that context, India is at the cusp of taking up the leadership. This is my core argument. And probably Security Council leadership would have an opportunity. There are many other opportunities. So I present it, my, my contention is that maybe we could have flagged it saying that we, are, we came to a position that and we had, and also we are, I'm not talking about in isolation. India got a 90 MOUs with um, on on particularly on and uh, vaccine uh, supply, 80 MOUs on a health related partnership, and we extensively played international global health partnership. So maybe we push our agenda a little further in the global relationship, and this is also slightly away from the traditional game of security, border security, militarization. Because militarization, what was done when we're talking about huge amount of money. We also have to play the global diplomacy game without a huge financial commitment. Human security, I mean, when we talk about Security Council membership, that comes with a huge financial responsibility, which we haven't thought about it. Without a huge financial responsibility, financial burden, we could expand our boundaries of um, our strategic diplomatic initiatives and health is one of the issues. So my contention is that India should explore, push our agenda in the area of global health. And this gives a legitimate opportunity for leadership role in the area of, and particularly in the developing countries in African Union, and also build upon what we have done already. So my contention, I, I summarize my presentation saying that India should utilize all this opportunity to expand our diplomatic exercise by incorporating health-related issues in the global trade and the global relationship. And India has, the opportunity has come to come out with a health diplomacy framework for the India's international relationship, India's foreign relationship. Thank you. Okay, good. I think both you and uh, Professor and uh, Ambassador's approach seems to be very prudent with, uh, with full of wisdom and uh, saying that take your time and not to rush because we have to project ourselves as a more matured and probably i was talking it from the point of view of what the most of the people must be thinking about when they read about what is happening in united nations about such kind of global crisis no i want to i still have two questions and i think joe uh, uh, professor was discussing about what is happening in myanmar and afghanistan and all that that i will keep as a last issue but let me first take the issue of what we call as a peace and security in today's world i think people even a common man now understands that the peace is not only related to silence the guns or it is not related to get into somebody else's border and occupy that territory or find the difference between the religion and keep on fighting. I think they have understood 
that in some of the environmental and nature based issues like climate change also disturb the security it also is very well connected with the peace and we have examples of that we have examples that arab spring really started mainly because the inflation in tunisia if you see the story we don't want to go beyond that but today there are number of reports are coming up that national security depends on taking action on climate change and not to allow our uh, some of the consequences of climate change become a new normal we don't want that to happen so don't you think apart from covid 19 i understood that there we have to take a sort of a wise mature and cautious stand but on climate change would you say the same thing why india did not flag that may not be the major agenda i mean i know maritime security is a major agenda i agree with you totally same thing about counter terrorism but my question is to ambassador is shouldn't we flag the issue like climate change for making a peace and a security issue not we are not going to solve the problem in one month but at least initiate the process so that it becomes an issue at the security council i know probably ambassador i, I hope he won't tell me that security council is not something to discuss climate change but but it is but now see what i hear many times ambassador is for the last 75 years the world has gone upside down its governments have changed businesses have changed civil societies thinking has changed only thing which is not changed is united nations rules and charter so i would like to have your view on why climate change should not be the issue of security council dr shende the world hasn't changed the world continues to remain the same power play game whether it is ipr for the covid vaccine or it is artificial intelligence or anything else i think we must understand we are becoming you know as uh, media and other things get infiltrated among us we are buying a narrative of other people you know what the big game is we should understand earlier the big game was very simple china becoming perhaps the number one country in the world you know when 1945 happened since from 1945 to let me say roughly if i say use covid as the watershed at least till 2010 or so there was one hegemon in the world if at any point they had some accommodation with the soviet union there was no accommodation on global economy and so on there was one hegemon for the first time there has been a challenge and this is what is happening i think this is something we should understand no one has any problem with global health leadership we should do it in fact i believe that you know we have the chairmanship of the executive council of the who we should be doing much more than leave the security council out the reason is please understand its rules and regulations are such that you don't bring in subject matters which will bite you dr shende you worked in the area of the environment you want me to tell your viewers how the montreal protocol came into being i'm not sure you would possibly like that but it came into being very honestly only because an american company discovered the antidote and after that they were willing to let all kinds of payments happen you know that's the nature of the power game and it works in uh, in environment it works in economics it works everywhere and that's something we should be quite clear india today is on the cusp of becoming a large player in the world we know we have to shoulder global responsibilities and professor thomas let me tell you i'm sure the calculations are made there will be cost to it there is no question about it at all but this is a power game i am one of the last guys to go about saying no no goody goody and we will get it no goody goody gets anything there is the famous case of japan 25 years the second largest economy in the world and should i say what where the state of place i am very honest and straightforward in india's situation is different sir on climate change i hope you are aware of the real situation in the world more than two thirds of the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere has been emitted by the developed countries and yet 
एंड इवन टूडे दे कंटिन्यू टू इमेट मोर देन फिफ्टी परसेंट ऑफ द थिंग Yes, there is China, which is also hitting twenty twenty one percent. But India is nowhere on the scene. And yet, what is the basic idea in the world in the COP twenty six? It is India should sign up to net zero by twenty fifty. A country which is the only G twenty member with a per capita income of less than two thousand dollars. I know all the arguments that you are talking about, but climate change is a global problem. Actions that India should take are not going to be different from the actions the rest of the world should take. we should do decarbonization we should do the best that we can ensuring at the same time development and a better life for our people global negotiations are about global burden sharing and in global burden sharing if you have responsibility especially those not only accepted morally but accepted legally in the signing of the unfccc please sign up and do that you know twice the united states has backed out the kyoto protocol was signed when there was a democrat administration mr al gore stood at co at kyoto and pleaded for it and yet when he went back to washington didn't let it get uh, uh, ratified by the senate mr trump we blame him for various things because he was blunt and open about it he withdrew from the paris protocol how do you know what's going to happen now even today their em emissions are 16 tons per person and ours are less than 2 so let's be very clear climate change is a very very serious perhaps the most serious problem confronting the world its legitimate place for tackling it is the un framework convention on climate change i don't understand why you are saying it should be done discussed in the security council why not at the framework convention the framework convention discusses issues of human security there are different organizations for different thing don't just get taken in by a theory which has been propounded by others i'm sorry to use this expression but i think that yours is a is a is a is a setup where the voice will be heard among a large number of people who are good interested but perhaps you know need to have a greater reinforcing of an understanding of why things are done it's very important to understand procedures it's very important to understand who wields what power and how things are done these very same answers can certainly be obtained at the un convention uh, framework convention on climate change what is the problem in doing it uh, why who are the ones you mentioned the us uh, permanent representative during the times of mr um, the previous administration talking about we should be sad what have the united states done you know it's all very well to make these statements what have you done in real terms they said we will support the ipr issue at the wto have they really done it not at all nobody is even talking about it and if the united states was so strongly behind the ipr issue you think the europeans won't have buckled by now let us understand the reality india is a country which is a force for good but let us also remember we are a country which is in a position to shoulder global responsibility but at the same time we must be endowed with global responsibility we were not grandfathered in 1945 like our chinese friends were bad luck i don't have the answers to that we want the reasons for that are also known we now have to work in a long drawn calibrated manner but we mustn't lose sight of it and we certainly shouldn't get detracted to a situation where things that we unleash turn around and come to us that is something you should be particularly careful because remember you are on your way to becoming the third largest economy in the world and the largest country in the world therefore the desire to make you shoulder more responsibility without having any of the global power play is something which we should clearly understood is something which is the way human uh, relations work the way international governance work okay thank you i want to thank you very much dr jain thank you thank you very much yes i think we have to understand our responsibility uh because we are going to become a world leader i already thought that we are the world leader so i think we we need to have some kind of an uh, strategy to see that i mean we are the world leader in spiritualism in yoga international day of yoga was agreed within few days and i think that kind of a spirit has to now continue that is what my uh, suggestion was in order to get your response because the others emitted more and we emitted less and hence the others should take responsibility more 
is a justice for is correct but we are dying there are landslides coming so how long we will keep on making that argument and why unfccc cannot do it because they have not done it up till now we are we are on a third or fourth decade of unfccc who has not done anything and those discussions do not matter at all that's why it has to go on a upper level that is the idea of what common people who understand climate change must be thinking about but well, let me i must to interrupt say. you i must interrupt you yes. i fail to understand how you can use the word at a higher level please don't say this i expect somebody like you would have worked in that system to know that that's not it it are just different organizations yeah sorry to, this, yeah. sorry to interrupt sorry to interrupt because no, 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 no. because i'll tell you why i'll tell you why i'm interrupting you dr shende it is particularly important that those who know reflect the reality of the situation there is enough happening in the world to try and make people understand things which are different but please and we count on somebody like you with your background with your understanding no no you don't know, make it personal i no, am not making I'm it personal i'm trying to get a best out of the debate yes and i am also trying to say that, that. that because i'm saying that the reality is Dr. Shende, the reality is we are dying you no no we are so so are people in in california yeah, correct. you know the uh, so whole world is dying understand this no no let me make this point to you again very strongly you matter you matter what you say matters that is why it is important no see, and okay you say the right things we will slightly we will sl slightly take the debate away from this point and get professor uh, uh, into the debate to see whether climate change is the issue which needs the action at at higher level than just unfccc that's that's the point as an academician i would have delighted to see that the un security council when the list of the wish list is prepared at least they would have flagged it or rather acknowledging the the crisis of environmental i mean it's not no more environmental changes we have almost started calling it and referring it as um, environmental crisis and its crisis is real and there are various references and various uh, responses are coming up but um, from an activist from an academician from a policy influencer point of view we have to utilize all the platforms to flag it remind everybody constantly remind about the about the urgency of um, the climatic crisis and i looked at the climatic crisis from a health point of view the health implication of the environmental change is phenomenal it is much more serious and much more impactful than what we're talking about um, that we experience in today in the context of the covid pandemic and it's a combination of a uh, epidemic combination of environmental crisis and also we don't have the technological solution we may not have a vaccine to deal with the um, the, the temperature that the temperature increasing to 1.5 degree so we cannot have a, a, a private air condition i don't know technologically we may be able to come back cities being air conditioned so even we don't have a technological solution for the environmental crisis you know, that is not even in the immediate pipeline so if you look at um, comparing with a, a public health crisis with a, a, an environmental crisis both together is going to converge and create a phenomenal humanitarian crisis and that's in the pipeline absolutely no doubt that when you look at the data evidence an emerging crisis emerging urgency it gives a very clear indication that you know that the next global crisis is how to deal with the impact of um, environmental transition i wish security council would have acknowledge that position i know that um, security council may not be able to take up everything but i saw the list of their priority list and at least they could have flagged it and also this is a two year agenda but at the same time i mean there are few issues which has to be addressed by everybody whenever there is an opportunity whenever there is a platform we should make sure that you know as part of our leadership responsibility we should flag it and try to get new perspective new insight and also new way of probably new way of thinking because this is two things i looked at global health as a crisis as a humanitarian crisis the human capacity the technical capacity to deal with this even that itself is not evolving who is doing something and wto is doing something and other specialized agencies are doing something at the same time we have a decisive precise a global action to deal with the global crisis a public health crisis which is phenomenally um, it it moved into a humanitarian crisis 
from that if you look at that prism the similar crisis is going to evolve out of the, the environmental crisis and i just leave it that way why it's not happening these are the, i mean as ambassador puri mentioned that these are the very complex international phenomena but the complexity should not uh, take our energy or attention our, our capacity to dream about uh, the possibility of a different life and so as an academician as a person who worked in this sector i think my message to even my students i say that you have a responsibility to think differently and hope for the better that's our responsibility when you look at um, when you look around and uh, there are very limited and bright spots you can see is take the case of covid take the case of um, environmental crisis an objective analysis giving a very gloomy future but we have, as a human being we have a responsibility look at positively towards the future as a teacher academician this is what you have to do the students look at positively look at uh, answers look at technological solution look at idea of solution look at thinking solution so from that point of view i look at uh, security council as a major influence factor just to set the agenda this are our agenda this are our concerns we may not be able to act on it so my submission is that um, un security council has a major yeah, institutional framework to set our agenda to flag our, our wish list or put it as a wish list i would say that we could expand it the possibility because the traditional way of doing business with the un has to change i'll just conclude my statement saying that when we talk about un un reform i would even say that the time to reform the the veto the power system and why what is the basis ethical moral principle moral basis for five countries holding the secret, the veto power probably it's like any other uh, the democratically elected process should select the, the the governing body of 15 members so un security council un reform agenda could have been put in india is very conspicuously silent on the un security un reform un reform should begin with uh, un security council reform the veto power mechanism that's extremely undemocratic unprincipled unethical it has to go maybe india should have requested we are not just asking for a position at the security council as it is now we are asking for a democratically elected security council thank you i know it's a it's an extremely <laughs> a visual yeah. thing i i dare to put it across right. thank you there, there are definitely two issues which we are not yet touched upon uh and i think both were hinted by a professor earlier one was the conflicts around us which are not which are going on irrespective of the climate change or covid 19 they have not changed the typical example is taliban another example is myanmar and i think to be fair with the indian representative he did say that apart from these three priorities of counter terrorism then you have a maritime security and the peacekeeping there are other sub issues on which india would push and those are conflicts in syria somalia yemen uh, they also talked about some resolutions we made about lebanon and mali and sudan and that kind of thing so let's come to that point which uh, i think uh, with great enthusiasm professor was uh, mentioning uh, during his first intervention and i heard one statement from you professor that india is close to the military junta in myanmar so if you start pushing the issues like that of myanmar and afghanistan issue is probably more serious for uh, india sensitive because it is so close and it has a history of it and that kind of thing don't you think pushing such agenda would look like self serving president of security council is there any such kind of a thing i think i, I should first give the uh, chance to ambassador and then probably a uh, professor ambassador uh, professor thank you very much uh, for this look uh, the subject of afghanistan as you know has come up in the security council on the request of the council and i am personally very strongly convinced that this is an area in which frankly speaking not we don't have many tools but afghanistan is of critical interest to us for our peace and tranquility and so we have a vested interest that afghanistan remains peaceful and tranquil uh not many tools the un is 
possibly a tool. If anybody had a magic wand, somebody would have waved it. But given the state of play, it should be done. It has it has always been on the agenda. Incidentally, I'm not sure if you are aware, but there is an old thing called the Taliban Sanctions Committee of the Security Council, which was actually formed even before 9/11. This has uh, this deals with people who are uh, people and entities. uh belonging to the taliban under whom there are sanctions and presently india is the chair of that committee mm. so you know we have a locus also and so on and so forth mm-hmm. and i completely agree that this matter needs to be looked at and i personally look i'm not familiar with current pulls and pressures that the government is facing and we all know the arguments of the united states wanting to leave their domestic constituency having run out with the ideas become fatigued they need pakistan to be able to get things done all those arguments are known but from our perspective reaching out to the taliban or doing things that's one thing but among some of the few options that you have available because this is a critical absolutely critical thing for you given your experiences the un is one of them. is keeping or somehow or the other keeping peace and tranquility there is an absolutely necessary and uh, element now i'm not touching upon uh, myanmar i take it that you lost that separately is that right dr shende or you want me to touch upon myanmar also uh i'll leave it to you okay sir i mean i, I don't you know you have more uh, no, so, kind so then, of then, no, let me mention about myanmar look uh, we are a neighboring country from myanmar and you know that there have been a number of sets of issues over a long period of time setting in delhi or uh, in bombay and pune etc we perhaps are not that familiar with the kind of nexus of both terrorism narcotics etc which flows on that border and things have really been problematic so dealing with the government of myanmar is something of which we have no choice in the matter. you every country would like to have a government in another country of its choice its best friends etc but life is not like that it doesn't work like that. for india there is no choice but to work with the governments of myanmar that we should also be doing things about democracy in myanmar etc i think i personally would not agree uh, disagree with that i am all for it but the nature of the game is such that you have to look at you know who's pushing what what are the other people's agenda and india's situation with myanmar cannot be exactly similar or cannot be even you uh, know in, in a sense simply taken from the basket of those who are sitting 5000 miles away we are a neighboring country we actually share a land border and there are a number of issues and problems That's- and taking all of this into account i think by and large the governments have always taken the view that look we wish the people of myanmar we wish the country of myanmar all the best we are a democracy we stand for democracy we believe democracies and rights are etc are very important but we have to deal with the government of the day because the government of the day is in control and this i'm afraid is a practical set of reality which uh, which which uh, look at this particular thing so i'm afraid uh, that's the way these have always been the way decisions have been taken and i think there is very great good sense in terms of the continuity of taking these kind of practical decisions. pragmatic sorry sorry for that yeah sorry for that. pragmatic decision yeah yeah good uh professor your your opportunity on the, that subject which you started uh, in the beginning go ahead um, th- thank you dr shinde and um, uh you rightly pointed out that you know maybe we discuss some of the critical issues first then we look at the uh, two other issues which um, i have um, uh i have some particular view to look at both afghanistan and the um, uh, myanmar and how india should be actually involving it and um, uh, we also be talking about peace operation and probably what we should look at the taliban is that um, the financing mechanisms of the taliban and who is supplying the arms and ammunition and who is benefiting from the arms and ammunition sales probably that's what we should expose in the nexus between global trade in arms and ammunition particularly small arms and ammunition and there are several un resolutions which is looking at the issue of financing terrorism and financing the non state actors and how to deal with it. probably this is the one thing we should ask 
and as a long probably we should be start thinking about as a, as a possibility un peacekeeping mission at afghanistan it may not be uh, away from um, i mean too far away from the discussion stage that's um, i mean i just flagging the possibility but myanmar is slightly different when we talking about myanmar we cross, we have a, an immediate uh, reason for why we should be concerned both in one point point of view we are receiving refugees from both countries afghanistan is limited number and also our neighboring country bangladesh is already hosting a million um, uh, rohingya refugees and we should not say that that's a bangladesh problem not our problem and bangladesh problems are largely our problems as well when you look at the geopolitical point of view when bangladesh is flooded with the myanmar refugees india has to play a very proactive critical role we cannot uh, sit back and say that we that if the refugees comes to india we'll kick them out that may not be the right way because and also remember india is not a party to the the global refugee convention so from that point of view india is a traditionally refugee accepting country we have a significant number of chinese refugees in india i mean i am a tibetan refugee so i may call it in a different way we have sri lankan refugees afghan refugees and also we had a huge history of bangladesh refugees coming here then rather they going back after a while so in the context of refugees we should keep in mindful about it both afghanistan both myanmar but at the same time the financing mechanism of these two countries and how the the regime changes may be propped up by the financing mechanism we should be very careful about it we should have a, an opportunity to look at this and um, in the afghanistan effort what is seldom discussed about is that the financing mechanism of the the taliban regime and also how they derive legitimacy from there and i had an opportunity to travel to afghanistan extensively all the provinces we call them as some of them as um, war lords but actually when you look at carefully they are water lords they are the custodian of the traditional uh, the source of water and then the power came from the custodianship of water so this is also about you know the natural wealth in afghanistan so that's the one of the controlling mechanism so we have to look at afghanistan from a very immediate urgent threat for the india's interest in the global level in the trade level and also we have our um, uh, the trade route towards iran there are various aspect of it so india has to find a way to engage taliban and also which of and uh, the yeah, the the power position changing we have to find a way to engage and that in the public space it is not happening but definitely there may be a, a different uh, channels of communication may be taking place but these two issues afghanistan and myanmar both are totally different kind of it you cannot even compare these are the two same similar peace issues need to be addressed need to be looked at it and uh, probably if you want to have some success in the un uh, india's position chairman check position at the security council may be initiating a positive dialogue in these two areas and particularly probably we may be able to come out with some positive response in the area of myanmar at least coming out with a road map towards normalizing afghanistan but mindful about the chinese interest in in myanmar and particularly the rohingya refugees are actually they there are um, there are huge mining interests there are huge petroleum interests and also gas interests so these are the some of the issues we have to keep in my uh, and back of our mind this has got immediate implication on our economic interest as well so maybe we should play a very separate role in afghanistan dialogue and myanmar dialogue thank you very much very good <laughs> i think a very complex but i think you clarified the issue quite well i think i remember when uh, prime minister modi for the first time become uh, uh, head of the government he said that neighbors first and i think uh, from that angle it looks to be a correct thing we though we are not sure whether is a security council issue and even if you take it in the security council whether it would be termed as a what is called as a self serving interest interest but uh, less i think we have about 10 minutes left for our maximum 90 minutes and we are going to stick to it so i think the very last point which is going to be interesting and i'm going to start with our ambassador who has a hands on experience on policy making uh, so apart from what we heard 
from Tirumurti, uh, who is our permanent uh, representative uh, on United Nations. He talked about first three priorities. Then he said, these are not the only one. There are some other things that they are going to do that. The conflicts in, uh, in various things like Somalia, Yemen, Syria, etc., And resolutions on Lebanon, Mali, and this. And probably India will succeed in doing that. Because obviously India is consulting with uh, other uh, members before putting that agenda to them. So the question is, apart from whatever the India is planning to do as a president, as well as a non-permanent member of the Security Council, do you think something is left out and what that list could be? At least seeding it, because you can't have a crowded issues and then you don't achieve anything. Is there anything very important left out as per you, which should have been India's priority to take it at the global level? And the same question I will ask to Professor as well, Ambassador. And with that, we will uh, we'll close the issue, we'll close the debate. Dr. Shende, thank you. And thank you very much for this. You know, I'm here in my completely private capacity. They, I'm not here uh, explaining what the government is doing or not. I'm reading the same newspapers as you are. Uh, it is my, look, the Security Council is a routine body also. There are many things which are happening. So many of the things which the permanent representative mentioned, Somalia, Lebanon, this, that, they are coming up in routine. There, there are peacekeeping missions there, their reports come up, resolutions are adopted. So there are incremental movements which keep taking place. And since you are a member of the Security Council, you have to be on board as the president. You know, you chair the session. Uh, so there is a kind of routinization, which also people need to understand. We took up three subject matters as those where we were kindling interest. Um, peacekeeping, certainly very important for India, counterterrorism, everyone knows it. But maritime security, which has not really been explored at the Security Council, but which is increasingly... A, major global issue, issues of access, issues of crimes at sea, etc., etc. And of course, India has a vested interest. Very in true. But talking about what perhaps should have been done, and it got done one way or the other, and it was mentioned by the permanent representative too, is Afghanistan. I have no doubt in my mind. I have absolutely no doubt in my mind, of course, that A, Afghanistan is a matter of the Security Council. It's always been there. As I told you, we chair the Taliban Sanctions Committee. Given the nature of what had happened uh, 20 years back and what you might foresee again, peace and tranquility in Afghanistan is a huge, big question mark, along with lots of other dangers of violence of all kinds. And we have been the victims of that. Can we keep things away? Is the UN an answer, perhaps, because the number of answers that you have are very limited. And so, therefore, in my opinion, this is the subject to which we didn't give that kind of, let me say, prioritization, but which got the prioritization. Uh, in, in the end, you are interested in outcomes. I mentioned to you that exactly 10 years back, the first time that Syria, we managed to get a discussion on Syria, in the Security Council in the wake of the Arab Spring was in August of this year and a presidential statement was issued. Mm. It's only a beginning. Many things happened, many things that didn't happen with. Right. With Afghanistan, a statement did get issued at the what is called the presidential statement, which means everyone came together. If you can get the global community to kind of agree, and it means in particular the P5 to kind of agree that they also need to have a vested interest in peace and tranquility in Afghanistan, then it will be movements in the direction that hopefully are of interest, concern, and particularly, I would say, good as far as India is concerned. Thank you. Very good. I think that is a, that's the best way to conclude uh, your uh, stand on this. I know it is not a stand of uh, ambassador per se, but it is a stand of what you personally feel based on your experience. Uh, Professor. Thank you, Dr. Shinde. And um, uh, I mean, I again push my envelope of uh, my wishful thinking about what could have been happened at the Security Council. And uh, we know that on 9th August, our uh, Honorable Prime Minister, he chaired the session and virtual uh, meeting on um, uh, the maritime security. 
Mm-hmm. When I looked at the speakers and the co-hosts of this particular event, I was thinking that maybe Indian diplomats should have looked at the possibility of um, uh, some of our partners. I mean, the partners I use in the broader sense are the co-speakers or co-facilitators. For example, maybe somebody from the SAR, somebody from a, a BRICS, or maybe the Quad we're talking about, rather than uh, the African Union leadership is um, more or less it's it's reduced in the symbolic leadership. So India's stature could have been increased and improved by inviting another little more senior leadership as a co-speaker with um, our, our prime minister. And this, I'm just putting it very diplomatic with, and in the framework without it denouncing, without undermining the sovereignty of any nation, any, any president. But India, Indian diplomats should have been a little more careful about ensuring improving the status of our prime minister by inviting some of them, some other our partners. So this is the one thing I see that um, a lost opportunity. And the second thing I would say that looking at the peace and, um, and looking at the Afghanistan, maybe we should emphasize more on the financing aspect of the, of the Taliban regime. We didn't make, uh, made much effort to noise about the issue of the, the, the financing of the Taliban uh, phenomena and uh, particularly the arms and ammunition supply for Taliban. And what is the source of that? It could have been exposed and we could have debate, created a debate, genuine debate within the existing framework, financing terrorism in the context of um, Taliban. And this is, and also the consequence is going to be very severe. What no democratic benefits Afghanistan achieved is going to be undermined, particularly girls' education, uh, children's rights, and also girls' um, uh, women's Status in the society. One positive thing I noticed that our foreign secretary, our ambassador Harshvardhan Singla, he talked about uh, children in the secu- in the conflict area, and he made a very strong statement about children in um, armed conflict and the Security Council prayer to that. So that I would see it as a positive trend, slightly moving away from the traditional framework of sec- Security Council response, and it was a very decisive, uh, very informed presentation about the role of children, how children are being and influenced and involved in the armed conflict in, um, in both states, uh, states and as well as the uh, non-state actors as well. Sorry about that. So, so our um, in contribution, the area, particularly in the area for children's role in the conflict and the peacekeeping operation, I would say, I would say that that's one of the brilliant effort, but that didn't took its logical expansion. And uh, our foreign secretary, he made one statement and this, it's not, I, I didn't see any follow up on that. I wish there could have been a further follow up. Since he made a statement, we could have looked into that. And uh, again, uh, there is a serious dialogue at the issue of uh, Myanmar refugees. I mean, the, the Rohingya refugees, whether it's a security issue and it is a security issue for Bangladesh, definitely. And uh, Bangladesh is our friendly neighbor and friendly partnership. Maybe that could have been a very good gesture to Bangladesh and highlighting our neighbor's problem at, a, at the highest body of that. So these are the, some of my random thoughts about um, what are the opportunities. It's not necessarily a systematic analysis of what are the opportunities which we missed. But two, three things I can see that we could have been a little more proactive from an outside point of view. I know the, the nuances and also the very limited human resources by which Indian mission is working in New York and the, the actual number of people who could really work behind the scene and create the, the statement and resolutions. Uh, if you compare with some other countries, have very limited manpower, we're working on that. With all that consideration, from the framework of a traditional way of how Security Council work, India did reasonably good. Uh, but at the same time, from expectation, aspirational point of view, we could have done much better than some of the issues I put forward. And thank you, Dr. Shinde, for organizing this and asking for me to speak about some of the opportunities for India at the international platform. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor. In fact, I should thank you because in one of the discussions, this issue came up. Why not have this? And um, I think I I must thank Ambassador because he made uh, this debate lively. And with your health background and COVID-19, I think we we are almost contemporarily involved in it uh, to make sure that we don't go too much back in the history and remain in the forefront of the issues like Afghanistan, COVID-19, et cetera, et cetera. I think this debate was really good. I wish it is being heard 
by some of the people from Ministry of External Affairs, or maybe they are listening to it. We don't know. Mainly because the uh, ambassador is there, no, not because of me moderating it. But uh, I think a lot of good points came, and I don't know whether the similar uh, debate was there in the past. Uh, I mean, we have about uh, 15 days past 1st August when we got the presidentship of uh, Security Council. So let's see how it evolves. We will see it. We will also see from Atharva and uh, Durga about how many are we are listening on Facebook. We will get that statistic soon. Uh, but what I want to highlight uh, is a concluding remark, and it is exactly two minutes past 7.30, is that uh, I think our debate was a proactive, no doubt about it. We are not saying, it, it was not an informative per se. It was about strategy and options, as the title said. And I think we did go into that and covered most of the issues there. I also feel that uh, there is something which probably Prime Minister's office forgot. I'm making a very cautious statement here, because we are talking about a Prime Minister's office. See, normally Prime Minister has this inclusive way of organizing events. He says that if he's giving a speech on 15th August, what are your ideas? Tell me. Then he will say that, okay, my one month monkey bath, give me your ideas so I can take it up. I don't think he did that before India became a president of Security Council. Probably it was, it was thought that it is so high an event, only restricted to ambassadors and uh, experts. So people may not have any, any, any ideas about it. But I'm sure the Indian uh, uh, common man, I'm not talking about those who don't read the, those who don't read about such thing, but many youth today, those who are uh, appearing in a competitive examination or uh, very good in uh, debates and all those things, they might have had a good idea about it. And probably our ambassador Tirumurthy <laughs> probably would have benefited from that. Uh, I'm not sure whether uh, Ambassador agrees with it, but uh, I just wanted to make that as a last comment before closing and thanking Ambassador, as well as uh, Professor, you. And uh, probably we can have a second part of it or third part of it when uh, India ceased to be president. And then after two years, when India ceased to be non-permanent member. Thank you very much. And sorry for not showing my face. I <laughs> wish you all the best. Okay, Thank bye. You, Thank okay. you very, very much. Bye, bye. Thank you. Thank you very much. And um, as a concluding statement, I would say that in the Indian academic intellectual uh, grouping, there are very limited discussion is taking place about mm -hmm. India's role internationally. That way, I, I congratulate your initiative and uh, taking this um, issue forward. And I uh, mean, um, that way, this is um, a, a path breaking initiative. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, Bye. Thank, yeah. you, and thank you, Dr. Thank you, Ambassador. Thank you very much. Bye.